starting today. And um, the, uh, well, last week during Brother David Pinkston's talk, Becky leaned over to me and said, is your talk gonna be as inspiring as this one is? Uh, Brother David, that was a hard talk to beat. You know, when you're pulling the most inspiring scriptures together one after the other, uh, those that give us the most hope, uh, it's hard to be as inspiring or more inspiring than that. And in fact, my title <laughs> might clue you in <laughs> that, uh, well, it, mocking might seem like a, a little bit of a um, negative topic this morning, and it's true. I, I will be speaking about some negative things for some time, but I also know that negativity is really not what we need, especially at this time. So I promise that we will come to the end with a much more positive message for and about all of us. Uh, I hope to create an opportunity for us to change the way we, we see and we think about each other uh, as unique creations of God. Uh, I've started using a website called commuterverse.com to prompt me every day to do my daily Bible reading. Uh, the site, which is run by some of our brothers and sisters in Arlington, is just getting off the ground. Uh, and the goal of the site is to provide a single thought to ponder while on your daily commute, ironically enough right now. Um, and there's an opportunity con to contribute to these daily thoughts. And in addition, the site provides links to the chapters from the standard daily reading plan. And uh, I recommend a commuter verse is a very good site. Uh, so check it out if given when you have the opportunity. And while reading Proverbs a few weeks ago, I was struck once again, every time I read Proverbs, it strikes me just how difficult it can be to remain focused. Uh, you know, because one verse, one proverb doesn't flow from and into the next one. Uh, or at least that's the way it seems to me. Rather, each verse or proverb is often a non sequitur, uh, just standing entirely on its own. But now that's not always true. For example, if we look at Proverbs 9, starting at verse 7, it says, whoever corrects a mocker invites insults. Whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom, your days will be many and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. If you are a mocker, you alone will suffer. So these verses flow one to another and tell us that if we attempt to correct a mocker, we will be met with abuse and hatred. On the other hand, if we point out error to a wise person, they will be thankful that we were there to help them. The wise will be rewarded for their introspection and humility. The mocker will suffer alone. How? Why will they suffer alone? Well, I suspect it has something to do with the source of the mocking. Why does someone mock another person? For some, it's probably a coping mechanism for dealing with a lack of their own self-confidence. So they lash out to make themselves feel better by finding something wrong with someone else. And of course, their lack of empathy in anyone, there, there's a lack of empathy in anyone who mocks. So these mockers will continue to suffer alone because they continue in their destructive way rather than 
trying to seek wisdom. They continue to cause pain and do nothing to resolve the pain that they are feeling within themselves. There, that's my psychology 101. And so, yeah, this is starting to sound negative. That's not what any of us needs. But I promise, I promise to bring us back to positive thoughts in the end that I hope will inspire us to value each other and see that God has specifically made each one of us as we are for a reason. All different and all uniquely valuable to him and to each other. Now, anybody who knows me knows that my form of humor has not developed past high school. Uh, high school sarcasm and mockery. It, did I hear you say something? <laughs> About my form of humor? Yeah. <laughs> it's easy. It's fun. It's at someone else's expense. And it demonstrates my superiority over that person. It helps me feel better about myself because I can point out a way that someone else is weak or lacking in some way. I know it's not the best use of my talents and I know it can be hurtful. I know it's destructive. That's why I only do it behind people's backs. But again, it's so easy and it's so satisfying sometimes. And let's face it, I'm so clever. But then I was reading in Proverbs and this one verse just struck me and has really stuck with me. Whoever mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. Whoever gloats over disaster will not go unpunished. Those are powerful, powerful words. If, when, I mock someone, I'm essentially saying God made some mistakes when he made you. Either God didn't know what he was doing, or he was careless, or he didn't care how you turned out. If I had made you, you would be different. You'd be better, more like me. When I mock, I'm showing contempt for God who made you. Okay, but I would certainly never make fun of somebody because they're poor. What would that say about me if I mocked someone because they didn't have money or things? But then again, maybe I do mock the poor. After all, what's poverty? especially in Proverbs. Sometimes it's completely straightforward. As in Proverbs 30, where it says, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Now, clearly, that's talking about money and resources or the lack of it. But other times, Proverbs refers to spiritual poverty and wealth, as in chapter 20, verse 13. Do not love sleep or you will grow poor. Stay awake and you will have food to spare. Well, now, while there may very well naturally be a, uh, be a natural application to this, it's pretty clear that the writer is speaking metaphorically. If we sleep like the 10 virgins slept, we will slip into spiritual poverty and we will be taken by surprise. We need to stay awake. We need to keep ourselves spiritually active in order to have plenty of that spiritual food nourishing us. In Proverbs 8, wisdom is personified and is calling out and wisdom says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield 
surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing a rich inheritance on those who love me and making their treasuries full. Now, unless we believe hook, line, and sinker in prosperity theology, the only way to interpret this, I think, is to equate wealth with wisdom. Wisdom is the best and the highest form of wealth and honor and prosperity. Wisdom's wealth is better than gold. And another proverb in chapter 10, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. So going back now to our verse of the day, whoever mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. Do I mock the spiritually poor? Perhaps not as such or not blatantly. I would not mock someone for having weak faith. After all, I know how weak my own faith is. I know where I struggle to turn things over to God. I want to say completely over to God. I struggle to turn things over 10% to God. So I wouldn't make fun of someone else's weakness. Or would I? Proverbs uses poverty to describe a lack of wisdom. Possibly a lack of faith. But I don't think it's too much of a stretch for us to say that poverty is simply a lack of something. Someone may be poor in faith, as I am. Someone rich in faith may be poor in intellect. A person with less intellect may be rich in hospitality or caring. A person with more intellectual gifts may be poor in empathy. What about humility? A humble, teachable person is called poor in spirit. And that's a good thing. That's, a, that's the best poverty to have, poor in spirit. Humility is not to be confused with a lack of self-confidence. I think we can safely say that Jesus was both the model of humility while also serving as the model of confidence in who he was, who he is, and confidence in what he was, what he is doing. For us, though it's true that a self-confident person well, it, it is true that a self-confident person may be poor in humility. And, and a self-confident person may very well be lacking in empathy. At this point, self-confidence becomes pride. And the question then is, is there a connection between pride and mocking? In Zephaniah 2, God is speaking about Moab and Ammon, two nations who were always thorns in Israel's side. And he says, therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, surely Moab will become like Sodom, the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a place of weeds and salt pits, a wasteland forever. The remnant of my people will plunder them. The survivors of my nation will inherit their land. This is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty. God is calling out Moab and Ammon for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty. Well, do I mock any people who belong to the Lord Almighty? Do I have an inflated pride about things, some things, that oddly enough may stem 
from a lack of self-confidence in other areas? I can safely say yes. I certainly have mocked people who belong to the Lord Almighty. I have mocked people who are here today, either in this building or online, listening to me right now, and I am ashamed for that. And further, do I decide who God's people are and are not? Do I decide who the people of the Lord Almighty are or are not? Do I say, well, okay, I'm wrong to mock my brothers and sisters, but others are fair game? Our leaders? Our neighbors? Is that okay? Whoever mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. What a horrible thought that is. If I mock someone, I'm showing contempt for God. If I mock someone, I'm effectively saying God didn't make that person right. That person is lacking something that I have, so there's something wrong with them. It's easy for me to mock somebody who I think is being dumb, when in fact, all I should say to that is, thank you, Lord, for the abilities you've given me. Help me to use the gifts that you've given me for good. What about other characteristics like lack of empathy, an inability to relate, a lack of humility. You know, these are all things that our current leaders are accused of on a daily basis, and that may well be true. But if someone, anyone, has a poverty of humility, a poverty of empathy, then they are poor and are not to be mocked for it. God is their creator, and they are not to be mocked. Whatever we might think, don't mock. 1 Timothy 2, verse 1, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior. I suggest it is impossible to mock our leaders and also pray for them. Speaking of the tongue, James tells us, again, very well known, therefore, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. To use a very current example, over the past few weeks, we've heard a lot from people who have a lot of opinions about the pandemic. We've heard a lot of different thoughts from people who are trying to decide or have decided how much the United States or individual states or cities should remain shut down or should open up. Chances are, each of us has our own opinions on those things, and chances are, our opinions are the right ones to have. Whether we actually have all of the facts or not, even people with all the facts and the training to back it up have different opinions. How can that be? Facts are facts, right? Well, chances are, we've also heard people with either opinion being mocked. If someone believes we should be opening up more slowly, then they've got no common sense about the economy. If someone believes that we should open up more now, then they are callous and care not only about themselves and care nothing about human life. We make it so black and white and one-dimensional, but in reality, when someone holds an opinion, their lifetime 
of unique experiences and personal circumstances and education are informing that opinion that they have. In fact, nothing makes this clearer than the more recent events of the last few days. If we've mocked these opinions, we have by extension mocked the people who hold them. Whether they're professional experts of some variety, whether they are people who are simply venting based on their own experiences or framework of thinking, whether they are our brothers and sisters. So now, let's flip this and look for the positive messages of encouragement. See, I promised it was coming. What positive messages of encouragement we can take away from today? Paul tells us that we're all different from each other for a reason. Again, very well-known references. Very familiar passage in Romans 12. He tells us that we are all parts of the body with different strengths and I think by clear inference, different weaknesses. When I mock, I focus on those weaknesses and forget about the strengths that each of you have. But if I'm honest, Every single person I mock is better than I am in some ways. But I ignore that. I think everyone should not only have their strengths, but they should have mine too. I forget how unnatural that would be. You know, hands can't see, eyes can't hold, a mouth can't hear, and ears can't speak but I forget that. And I forget that God made each of us and God is continuing to make and to mold each of us through our personal experiences. Romans 12. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body and each member belongs all to the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And there's no hint in here that any one person has all of those strengths, has all of those gifts. Paul picks up this theme of members of the body in Ephesians. He tells us how we should, as a result, naturally treat each other because we are all part of the body of Christ. The hand doesn't make fun of the eye. The tongue doesn't mock the ear. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Well, what is mocking if it's not falsehood and unwholesome talk? Does it build anyone up? Does anybody benefit from it? Again, Paul picks up the theme in Colossians, chapter 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. 
Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, we have a God-given opportunity to see our brothers and sisters and our neighbors and our leaders in a more complete way. Yeah, they all have weaknesses. And so do I. They don't think or act the way I do. But am I always right? They also have strengths that I don't have. Whether I want to admit that or not, it's true. Let's remember that God has made each of us, and he and Jesus are continuing to mold each of us. None of us will be perfect until Christ returns. So let's use self-control, and let's use wisdom to build ourselves and each other up to this one perfect body with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. And above all these, with love. Thank you. We'll continue now by singing hymn number 233. Jesus said, share this meal that you may remember what I give out of love for my people. Live in me, hymn 233.
if we can take a peaceful and grateful and appreciative view and recognize in our words and actions that we are all different. We're created by God to be different. Then we ourselves are creating an opportunity to reflect Jesus and to be a witness to Jesus's own humility and his wisdom by reflecting him. Jesus was mocked. They mocked Jesus because they were right and he was wrong. Stop and think about that for a moment. They were so confident and so proud of their rightness that they mocked Jesus. They also mocked him because right as they were, he was a threat to their way of life, their very right way of life. For this reason, I can say that Jesus bore my sins on the cross because he was crucified by people who sinned in exactly the same way that I do. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to have that laid bare for me and to see myself as I am. And what did Jesus do? He forgave them because they didn't know what they were doing. Our God, who is creating the body of Christ, is making up that body with each of us as members. We're imperfect now. And our Sunday school lesson this morning ties into this, but we're being made perfect. We're being made complete together, though we're imperfect now. But we're being, this body is being built up with each of us as members. This same God has made each of us and is making each of us to be a part of that body. Let's praise him for what he's making. Not just that I'm a part of it, but that each of us is a part of it. With our own strengths and our own failings, our own weaknesses. He knows what he's doing. And let's be actively compassionate and kind and humble and gentle and patient and loving toward every other member of this body of Christ. Paul says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'd like to ask Brother Robert if he'd offer thanks 